Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you today afternoon. The theme of this two and a half day program is energy transition. And you're addressing a large number of issues. It's a pleasure to see the, you know, the, the, the programs that are there, the themes that have been addressed, the speakers, the quality of speakers, etc. And this particular session is actually focusing on uh, financing uh, the energy transition. So before that, I mean, just I don't think the energy transition is any longer an option. We must take it as a given. I don't think the world has any option. And I think all countries, rich or poor, developed or developing, uh, high income, middle income, low income, I think uh, we better take it as given. We may all have our internal fights, arguments between countries on whether we should do it or not do it. But I think that's irrelevant. Uh, we need to get going. But I just want to bring out that when we talk of energy transition, we seem to somehow focus largely on energy in a very narrow sense of solar, hydro, wind, geothermal, whatever. But actually, there are many other transitions which are going on along with energy transition. And I think all of them need to be addressed. And I think that's something sometimes we often forget, even while calculating the numbers in terms of what is needed for financing transition. You know, There has to be a technological transition. I think that's something which is addressed. I mean, technologies have to change, which means the production systems have to change. All that has to change. To go with that, supply chain transitions will be there. The current energy system in the world has a certain supply chain. If you look, if you map the supply chains for the current uh, uh, fossil fuel systems, and you map the future supply chains for clean energy systems, they will be completely different. We need to plan and finance those supply chain transitions. There has to be a huge skills transition, and skills transition is twofold. I mean, it's not just the people who are going to operate the renewable energy and other uh, stuff that is there. But the large number of people are going to be unemployed because fossil fuels are going to go out of fashion. So in India, for example, more than 20 million people live on fossil fuels. The economies of a couple of states of India will go to dust if these people actually lose fossil fuels and their livelihoods are dependent on it. We have seen these arguments even in the United States, West Virginia. It opposes climate change because coal is integral to its economy. There are states in India where these things are integral to the economy. That's also a transition we need to plan for. To go with that, there are state economic transitions. We forget that petroleum and petroleum products are a major source of revenue for states. So the moment these things go, the entire fiscal balance of Indian government is going to change. I mean, currently the only source of independent revenue which states can actually uh, tamper with is petroleum taxes. And if petroleum is going to go vanish, what else is there in states in terms of taxation? So these are transition which has to be looked at very, very carefully. And mind you, it's not easy. There has to be an industrial transition which we are all aware of. I think another session handled that. All the industries, steel, uh, cement, aluminium, and a host of others have to do that. We also are quite familiar with there has to be a change in mobility, uh, EVs replacing uh, vehicles. And also we forget another thing, the transition in the construction sector. I mean, people think that, you know, the carbon in the atmosphere largely comes from, you know, this energy. And we think of polluting thermal power plant. The total pollution from thermal power plants in terms of carbon contribution is less than that of industry, of um, uh, uh, construction, and of uh, mobility put together. So that's actually as big, if not. And we forget agriculture. That's also an equally big you know, pollutant, quote unquote. And to go with all these, countries are developing, there are going to be lifestyle transitions. There are aspirations of the people of the developing world, the global south, who would like to have lifestyle similar to the developed world, the global north. And those, these lifestyles are unsustainable, so there have to be lifestyle transitions in terms of expectation. And to go with all that, all this word of just and sustainable transition, you know, who is to pay for what, I think that is that. But having said all that, I mean, all countries are entitled to development aspirations, but as, as I said in the beginning, this transition is a must. There is no escape, so everybody has to address it. And therefore, that's the challenge. And the challenge then is to how do you finance it? And I think that's what the session, and you've got panelists who will be talking about that. And I'm just highlighting four or five barriers we need to address if you have to get the climate finance thing going. I mean, firstly, I think you have the cost of capital issue. I mean, any capital needs returns. And the returns have to be justified to their investors or the owners of that capital. I mean, it's not charity. There is only so much charity will take you. And charity need not be individual philanthropy. I mean, in a way, countries also do charity. But that can be only a little small pie. And when you have global turmoil like what's happening in the Middle East or some other part of Europe, I mean, that's a limited pool of money. 
I mean, if that money is going to go there, it's going to come away from some other place. So there is actually a limited pool which actually donors can give. So we need to look at that. And that basically means you need to focus on private capital, give them returns, which means if there are problems, we need to address all those problems, like how do you generate new products? How do you create new arrangements uh, in underwriting and risk management, etc. I think so this is one whole set of problems that we do. The second big thing that needs to be done to actually get climate finance going is actually reducing risks. Risks could be manifold. There are technological risks, there are regulatory risks. I mean, think of what has happened to the, we have a former cabinet secretary, the power secretary also, he knows that. The entire gas sector in India is a whole bunch of idle debt projects. I mean, it's nothing but policy changes which actually kill the entire sector. Who is going to invest if you don't have policy stability? So I think that's a big risk. And there are ecosystem policy risks. I mean, these little renewable other stuff don't exist in isolation. So if you want to do an energy transition, the steel industry wants to turn green and they want green hydrogen, they need to know that they will get green hydrogen at their doorstep. Uh, I mean, a typical Indian case, the green hydrogen is on the west coast, all the steel plants on the east coast. They need to know that all these supply chains are going to be there. So I think their government has a major role in terms of trying to see that all these interdependencies are resolved. So I think that that's uh, another issue. And then enabling financial flows. There's a lot of gaps in terms of knowledge and structuring. I mean, Niti Aayog, for example, is... Uh, creating something called a UK-India Infrastructure Financing Bridge, which is about actually wanting to pick up, I mean, London is one of the three major sources of finance in the world, structuring sustainable projects, sustainable energy projects, which are amenable to global finance. I think that is missing. I mean, ministries do their things in isolation. The private sector does their thing in isolation. And one of the problems we are noticing is cheap long-term capital, which is insurance funds, mutual funds, they're not coming to India. It's largely private equity which is coming to India. So if you want to get this energy transition going, you need to get this cheap capital going. There are also information asymmetry risks. And this is like people not knowing what's happening in other parts of the world. So if somebody wants to invest in India or Africa, they don't know actually what's happening in the countries there. So I think we need to solve these information barriers. So I'm not going the charity route. I'm trying to see if you want to get private flows going, what do you need to do? And then lastly, one question, what's the balance between private and public capital? I personally think that more than 80% has to come from private capital. It's not going to be public capital. Public capital can be a catalyst. Public capital can actually fund projects which are otherwise not bankable or countries which are not bankable. Barring that, other than being risk enhancers and uh, de-risking specific projects. I think the whole world has to address seriously this question of how do we get private capital flows happening, which means addressing the first question which I said, cost of capital needs to be addressed. And I think that's very important. The last thing, is it doable? I think positively, yes. Uh, and why is it? Two or three big things. Take Africa, for example. Most of the structures that need to be there don't exist there. So you just can leapfrog generations and go to the next generation. Maybe slightly costlier, but you don't have to go to the fossil fuel route. You don't have to go to the thermal route. Second, take a country like India. I mean, it's, it's slightly better off. The simple point is, if you look at India and take our cities, 90% of India that is going to be there in our cities in 2047 has not yet been built. So you're at a wonderful point in history where you can actually hardwire green and sustainable stuff into your laws, into your regulations, and into your policies so that you build the right stuff. You miss the bus, you're going to start addressing legacy issues which a lot of other countries are doing. That's all I have to say. I'll be very happy to hear the panelists. Thank you very much. Hello, and uh, thank you all. And um, uh, thank you very much, sir. That was a very invigorating uh, uh, speech talk, practically. And, uh, but nevertheless, um, we don't have an enormous amount of time to go through a very complex series of questions, um, and um, we do have a slightly hard uh, uh, time limit as well. So I won't waste too much time um, on introductions because I think most of us know who you are. But what I am going to do is ask you to speak for three or four minutes on uh, the aspect of climate finance that most touches your experience and portfolio. And um, I'll start with you, Mr. Podar. Um, as somebody who has worked on the ground in India um, and in other emerging markets, but is also in some sense sending money here from the, the financial centers of the global north, what do you think is the overall framework with which you approach this question of increasing this pipeline? Thanks, Mir. And uh, I think CEO like Niti Ayok played a, framed a very interesting and a very broad, uh, I would say, facet to this entire question. 
Just a quick introduction of, of what we do. Uh, and by the way, that's not me. That's, that's, that's a smarter looking Abhishek Podar. Uh, but <laughs> uh, we represent about $600 billion of AUM investing in infra infrastructure, energy transition, both mature renewables as well as emerging technologies across the globe. Uh, a large part of that is actually in, in more developed markets, but increasingly we're seeing more on the, on the emerging markets as well. And then there's a part of Macquarie where we do a lot of carbon solutions and likes of those kind of things, right? I think from our perspective, Amir, as we look at the problem, uh, and depending on who you speak, uh, you know, people will say it's every year we need about $4 trillion. If you meet Mark Carney, he will say $8 trillion per annum is the requirement for energy transition. And what we understand is the money flowing is $700 billion. Half of that is flowing in from public sector. Half of that is coming from private sector. So it's a huge gap. So, you know, I think it's the question is completely gone. You need to break it down. Right, and let's look at some of these success stories. And our, our, ex our experience has been very simple. Whenever technologies and countries, they've defined, established frameworks, regulatory frameworks, transparent frameworks like auctions, FITs, capital flows in. Renewables is a very classic case in point, right? You look at India, in the emerging markets, you look at India, Brazil, Vietnam, capital has flown in, long-term capital like us, very competitive capital, pension funds, and likes of those kind of things. The problem happens when either the technologies are mature, but the country frameworks are not in place. And there are many countries, in, even in, in the global south, where the framework has not been done, where global investors like us do ascribe a very high risk premium to this, right? So there the, the solution is just you know, follow what's been proven in many of the markets and do it. It's easier said than done. We are, very, we are part of the jet fees in Vietnam and Indonesia, and both the good and bads that we are seeing. Uh, but, you know, the answer is actually as simple as that. Then you have the other side of technology, uh, of, of, of energy transition, which are the emerging technologies, the electric vehicles, the green hydrogen, the battery storages, and likes of those. Those are fundamentally at a risk, at a higher risk proposition today than, uh, than the mature technologies. Juxtapose on top of that the emerging market risk of currency, etc. Many investors and the investors that I represent do, do find it difficult. And that's where I think uh, the concept of blended finance, and that's something which we are very closely working with, where public sector comes in, de-risk it, underwrites a certain downside protection, and then the large-scale private sector comes in. I, in my mind, that's the right solution. And there's a case in point where we are right now in partnership with Green Climate Fund, putting out a $1.5 billion leasing and financing company focused on just electric vehicles in India, where GCF has committed $200 million of concessional high uh, risk equity, and we are bringing in over a billion dollar of our capital, right? So there are many of these kind of models that exist, and which is what we've been working on. Thank you so much, Mr. Podar. Um, I'm going to turn to you now, Dr. Fenton. Um, and the question essentially here that was raised is, there are sometimes in the absence of structures in receiving recipient countries for climate finance, um, an maybe excessive level of risk attached to some of the projects there. What is a sort of multilateral development finance world doing to use public money to address some of these risks? What are the sort of broader reforms that we have in mind? Yep. Thank you very much for the question. We don't have much time either for this panel um, or to address this crisis. And when I look outside, it's like apocalyptic out there and it really makes me feel the urgency. Um, look, from the EIB side, we are very proud of the fact that we are the largest multilateral on some measurements. Um, even though we're 90% active in Europe, we do around 10, 12 billion a year outside the EU. It's sizable. We've done 4.5 um, billion here in India, more or less. Um, but are we doing enough to catalyze private finance? We are absolutely not. In India, most of our finance is actually with the public sector. So we're investing in metros. We're investing in renewable energy via SBI, via IREDA. And these are fantastic projects, don't get me wrong. But we need to be, you know, if we're serious about really scaling up, we need to be bolder um, and we need to be getting behind innovative technologies. We need to be getting behind the hard project. Um, just a few thoughts about what we need to do to make a transition as an institution so that we get better at doing that because we've been talking about it for so long. So the first thing I think is really this like clarity of purpose. Um, and over the past two years, I've really seen our president going around and talking about us being EU climate bank. Um, we've committed to being Paris aligned, so we are no longer financing fossil fuels, and we're doing over 50% of 
focused on climate um, and environment. And that really, really matters. That has led to a cultural shift within the institution. But we have to hold that line. We can't be distracted. And thank you to India, actually, for really keeping us on it. The other thing we have to do is really this boldness. Um, and that involves really becoming a proper bank. Right? So understanding that we really have to take risk and we have to be serious about assessing that risk and you know, taking bets. We should be gambling. We should be losing money, losing taxpayer money. And that's uncomfortable, but that's a cultural change that needs to happen from the top to the bottom. And including you know, when we go to our risk management officers, when we go to our legal team, so they don't say, oh, but this is a weird financial structure. We can't sign off on it. It has to really be um, throughout. And then finally, the resources. Because you know, everyone always says, okay, with the private sector, you can catalyze funds, you can do more with less. Yes, but if you can't give us less as our stakeholders and expect us to do more. So we're going to need backing from our stakeholders in the form of guarantee, and we're going to need people, right? So when the financial crisis hit in Europe, we launched, um, it was called FC, European Fund for um, Stabilization and Investment, I forget, um, and we managed to do a huge amount, but we hired a lot of people, and I don't see that happening yet. I think we're moving in that direction. It's going to have to happen. And finally, we have to be much better at coordinating between each other. Um, there's so much to do. There shouldn't be any competition. Um, usually there isn't, but I still see it. And I still see we need to talk better to each other. Thank you. Thank you. There are two follow-up, uh, there are two ideas that have been raised uh, that I'm going to follow up later. One is on um, uh, early stage investments into risky technologies. The, one is, the other one is about people. And I think that's really important. Um, but for now, um, I'm going to turn to you, Mikita san um, and we've heard something about what it takes for the multilateral, for a multilateral organization to change. Um, as a bilateral organization, you have far less trouble scaling up. By, uh, uh, you, know, you only have one stakeholder to convince uh, if you want to increase your capital. Um, what are the ways, however, in which you feel you have been able to transform the way that institutions like yours look at this sector, broaden their perspective of the kind of projects they're willing to invest in? and make a change. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, yes, after hearing uh, my colleague, friends and colleagues here, um, and from a bilateral uh, DFI uh, perspective, uh, it's really a kind of a how to structure a blended finance uh, coordination. And it depends on uh, the technology, it could be uh, depending on which country are uh, developing those projects, and even so on. Um, what kind of uh, size are you thinking about? Uh, for example, um, from JBIC's uh, recent experience, uh, onshore wind projects is not so much of a high technology uh, uh, already. So uh, it, we have uh, directly provided loans to uh, SJVN uh, and NTPC uh, for their uh, solar power projects or renewable projects. Uh, not on the project finance basis, but a kind of a direct loan so that they could uh, uh, build uh, several uh, projects at once. On the other hand, uh, what we haven't done, uh, for example, in emerging countries like in India yet, is, for example, uh, an offshore wind uh, large-scale power project, uh, which we have uh, done in the United Kingdom, recently in France, um, even though for ourselves, uh, we have... Uh, signed the contract uh, last month uh, for a project in Taiwan, which JBIC provided both loan and equity. So it depends on uh, what sort of uh, technology you're based on, how large the scale is, and where you're doing. But uh, we can also, uh, not just the sponsors, the EPC contractors, the operators, but financiers also have uh, various uh, experiences, uh, different tools uh, within each uh, organization's toolbox. And trying to uh, coordinate one, for example, in India, uh, the grant or uh, those uh, uh, feasibility study uh, funding can be done by host governments, multilateral, multinationals. And for example, uh, for the mezzanine financing, maybe DFIs can step in. And uh, the senior part can be, of course, uh, covered by the private sector. I think that's the way you tailor-made uh, for each country, for each project. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to you now, Ms. Spencer. And we've heard a little bit about what other stages in the financial chain can do and how, what they want they want. But in some ways, your task is the hardest because you have to go out and find the initial technologies that are going to make the difference and scale up. What is it that 
longer term financial planners should be doing to help you? What is it the regulation should be doing to make it easier for you? Great question. I first actually want to start by acknowledging all the wonderful founders, entrepreneurs, technologists in the room. Uh, we have lots of big finance, big companies, but they are the ones actually driving change. So please give a round of applause. Uh, and, and I must appreciate and compliment GAP and ORF for bringing in those who, will act, who are actually going boldly where no one has gone before and creating the new models, both product innovation and process innovation models that will affect the changes that we need to be brought about at scale with speed. So technology is critical. Uh, let me share with everyone what we do at Avana. Uh, we are India's first technology, early stage technology fund focused solely on climate. So we don't also do climate, we only do climate. We invest in early stage technology, sort of pre-series A, series A, that are solving and creating fundamental solutions for energy transition, circular economy, industrial decarbonization, climate resilient agriculture, mobility and supply chain. So this is roughly sort of 90% of India's emission footprint. 70% of the economy, all of which has to move very rapidly at scale for the world to get to the right place on climate, not just India. Um, we are finding amazing technologies and technologists and founders and entrepreneurs who, if, you know, if we can solve for 1.4 billion people in India at our price points, and we are a very price sensitive country, um, lower middle income country, then we can solve for much of the global south with those solutions. And why just the global south? We can actually solve for a large part of the world. So that's what we invest in. And I'll come back to your question, Mihir. I think what we have talked about over the last couple of days, and certainly today, and you know, CEO Niti Aayog started us off on a very nice note, is we need the full stack of financing solutions. We need the large scale debt capital, scaling up, project finance, commercial capital. We also need the risk mitigation to be brought in by public finances. And we've had a session earlier today on MDBs uh, with uh, Mr. Sinha and uh, Singh. Um, in addition to that, there is a need for innovation finance. So who is financing innovation? This is not your old venture capital model of you know, fintech, consumer tech, SaaS playbook, hockey sticks. You cannot think about it like this. This is hard, deep tech. It will have a different growth trajectory. We have to find ways to finance that innovation, uh, certainly through private capital, but also create the pools of capital, just as we are thinking of utility scale, renewable energy. I would submit utility scale, renewable energy is actually a commercial proposition. It's lower risk. So I wonder why there is so much development financing going into that. It's great risk, right? You can raise 8 to 12% money globally hedged. Where is the money really going for innovation? Uh, it does not require that much capital. But as Nina mentioned earlier, I think there needs to be a change. You said, what are the asks? The asks are a change in thinking about risk and being willing to take some experimental risk here. Better linkages with our R&D system, laboratories, universities. So if again, I go back to the tiers of capital, different levels, layers of risk. The final tier of capital really is what the Rockefeller Foundation and GAP have taken a really, really big step on, and which is philanthropic capital. Philanthropic capital has the ability with their stakeholder purpose-driven capital to actually fund a lot of this innovation. And we saw yesterday with the Entice Awards um, and the whole Entice program that this is exactly what So we need a lot more of it. Thank you very much. Mr. Kimka, you've heard four views from um, four slightly different stages of the system. Give us a bird's eye view of what you think is required to get, as you put it, the inside out and the outside in working together. So over the last two days, and thank you again very, very much for this wonderful conference. I hope not only will it convene every year, that we're going to have some strong action tracks to Nina's point uh, about the urgency and to Mr. Subramaniam's point about the scale of the challenge ahead. But let's act together and it would be wonderful to be in partnership. Thank you, GF. Thank you, ORF, for convening this. If we've heard over the last 24 hours, the, and from uh, Mr. Singh, this morning, the, the landscape, and we've heard it from Stern Songway as well, of how the world financial architecture has to evolve to provide concessional finance, we must recognize a heroic effort has been made to 
to trigger that finance in very difficult circumstances of higher inflation, of fiscal balance sheets that are very stressed. So every little precious piece of that concessional finance should go as far as it possibly can. Working with sovereign wealth funds and pension funds for the last 17 years, we've asked ourselves only one question, which is how do we move the many, many trillions of dollars? The organization I advise, the IIR, is $12 trillion, 45 sovereign and sub-sovereign funds. How do we move their money in practice into emerging infrastructure? Not your part, Anjali, but the downstream on the scale up, which Stern Songwe says, there are a lot of numbers floating around, is a trillion dollars of extra finance every year for emerging market green infrastructure. How do we do it in practice? And it seems to me with the very limited amount of concessional finance that what we've learned from experiments all across the planet can enable domestic environments to de-risk, de this is to your point, Abhishek, earlier, in a way that's very systematic so we can get the maximum amount of lowering of risk relative to return in the way that Mr. Subramaniam was saying needed to be done, risk and return, cost of capital, but we do it systematically, and that's what's missing. We have little experiments in Colombia and in India. We've done a lot of good things. All over the world, we can see this. Can we systematize? And yes, we can. So we've submitted, and you very kindly at ORF have published, sorry, the, I should say the T20 has taken up this idea, what we call the three by five framework. And that is to say that we should include institutional investors ab initio in identifying the risks in a dialogue that is a dialogue of trust with government, with industry and developers and institutional investors from the beginning in five stages. Stage number one, we argue, is the government should set very clear signals and stick to them. You saw what happened in the UK recently. If you do that, that in itself de-risks the market. The second is the complicated stage. This is where we need not only to put in place the good regulations and recourse and, uh, and contract structures from all over the world and create best practices and PPAs in mobility purchase agreements and so forth, and de-risk indeed the counterparties, but at the same time also work at the sectoral country level on the players in that sector working together to coordinate. We've heard it all across this two days, coordination, coordination, coordination. In the bus area, something Mahua was doing, but we've been doing at the global level, bringing together operators, OEMs, city development people, municipal authorities, electron providers with state governments, with federal governments, sitting them and almost locking the door and not letting them to the bathroom until they've identified what the risks are and how we're gonna to work together to crack them. Because you know what? Capitalism does solve this. These links all happen, but it takes 10 to 15 years. We have to do that in two years. So therefore, we need everyone in a room together to crack the risks and work on it. The third stage is what we keep hearing about pipeline development, and clearly we need support on that. But the biggest support we need as large institutional investors, there is aggregation. Many of these categories are not sufficiently aggregated. That's very important as well. Stage four, if you do stages one, two, and three, we would argue the amount of concessional finance you need is much less. So you're now using that concessional finance precisely where Jayant and others were talking about on things like currency risk that cannot be de-risked by good policymaking in stages one, two, and three. And then normally the process stops, and that's a mistake. So COP27 had 250 projects. How many of them were funded? Because they were not syndicated. There's no Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch or Bank of America who's going to do this for you. So these projects also need to be then syndicated to the right kinds of investment, Anjali for venture or to Macquarie as for infrastructure. So this is what we call the three by five, and it's come out of 17 years of working with these institutional investors. Think about how we do it and looking at the best practice we've seen all over the world. Right. Um, congratulations, all five of you. You are all very crisp, and we have 20 minutes. So that means that we will at least have a couple of, of uh, questions that we will ask each other, and then we might even be able to take a couple from the floor. Um, I'm going to pick up on one of the points, um, in fact, one that was made by you, Dr. Fenton, and I'm going, to, I'm going to take it to you, Mr. Podar, and then ask others to come in as well. People. Um, 
do we have enough people in the public sector, in the private sector, um, in government, um, who have the capability and the financial know-how to make this kind of ex you know, exponential change in the amount of capital flowing between borders and into these sectors possible? Are those people there? And if not, how do we get them into this? Mihir, this is not a rocket science, trust me. Financing is, is not, it's made out to be uh, this massive issue and a lot of stuff. It's, it's actually very logical, very basic things to what Uday was talking about. It's very, what you do is focus on how you can do this, where the requirement is, and it's like what we, many of us would have learned in our undergrads of economics, et cetera, when there's, there's a deficit of a certain resource, focus on where the impact is, as simple as that. So I don't think people is an issue, right? Um, I think where the issue becomes are we are all working in our own silos. And this is where I get, personally, you know, as being an analyst and observer of this space, I get extremely frustrated when I meet with the LPs and the, and the philanthropic organizations and the MDBs that are representing trillions of dollars on one hand. I see needs of Global South, which needs trillions of dollars, but the funnel is absolutely missing. And that's what we need to solve for, right? So I think that's where what Uday and others have been talking about, get everyone together, get everyone early. And Bill, you know, we've had a, we have had our first hand experience when we worked with Green Climate Fund. It's a great one, it's a World Bank organization, the kind of capital they can underwrite is, is phenomenal. It took us four years. I have told them that I don't have the patience to go through that again. You know, because we have to prioritize X versus Y, right? That's what we need to do. We need to understand, you know, uh, as private sector, how public sector thinks and what their requirement and vice versa. So it's actually putting all the stakeholders together rather than the people issue itself. I want to pick up on two things. One is uh, the need for coordination. And it is coordination across not just providers of capital, but also users of technology. Because if we, in order to have a step shift change in our trajectory, we actually need a fundamentally lower carbon growth model for industry. India certainly and other countries will not stop growing, right, because of emissions. We have to accept that. And so consequently, we do need to find those new innovation pathways that lead to lower carbon industrial activity that is adopted at scale with industry. So the coordination also needs to happen between the innovation ecosystem and in the industrial ecosystem where adoption needs to happen at scale. And again, I say at scale with speed. So that's one point. The second point, again, is coordination across the global north and global south. Climate is a global system. So no one country, one continent, one ecosystem can solve on its own. We have to work together. And there's a lot more focus on carbon and GHG, say, in the global north. So in, in climate speak, it is mitigation. Whereas the everyday reality of the global south is adaptation and resilience building. We have to do it in a way where our vulnerable communities, MSMEs, farmers, the poor, are protected. You know, if temperature is touching 50 degrees Celsius, you cannot have a rising income country like India, for example, not use more air conditioning. Right? There are, there's going to be more air conditioning. Farmers, if they have to move to regenerative farming, how do they make up for the loss of yield over two to five years? So I think some of these are very practical transition financing requirements. And it is not just about renewable energy. We have to also think about other aspects of the economic and social activity. Thank you, Jason, about coordination. Um, your so may I make one final course. point? You know, we haven't talked about water. We think about water as a scarce resource. Water has tremendous energy intensity. When we waste water, to get back to portable water and usable water is a very in energy intensive water cycle. So there is tremendous energy intensity embedded in water as well. I think at this current moment, there is nothing more geostrategically important than a secure and supp uh, uh, supply of water. It matters for the semiconductor industry, and the semiconductor industry matters for everything. Um, Thank you, Tassan. Um, I think the question that we heard uh, from a lot of people was one about coordination. And in the end, institutions like yours um, coordinate up and down the line. They coordinate uh, vertically across different kinds of finance. 
and they co uh, coordinate horizontally across different regions, different technologies. What are your thoughts on this? How can we get this uh, work better? Get this to work better? Thank you. Um, yes, your uh, kind uh, question. In addition to human resources allocation, um, is of course our challenges. But on the other hand, um, for example, it, it, the energy sector is, of course, in some uh, sense, unique. But of course. Um, Internally, for example, uh, we have so many experts in the uh, project finance or in the equity investment team who can uh, cover uh, various uh, sectors because, of course, in some sense, uh, they are unique uh, one by one. But on the other hand, most of the areas like due diligence, how to do the coordination uh, with uh, your, your counterparts, uh, government, or uh, with the private sector, that can uh, be uh, used in uh, various uh, ways of uh, transactional uh, coordination. On the other hand, uh, we have, for example, uh, a, an MOU with the EIB, uh, with uh, the ADB, also with the USDFC and the others, bilaterals, multilaterals, that has different uh, tools uh, in their toolbox uh, that are mentioned at, at the first uh, point, but also uh, that has experiences in various uh, different uh, countries, different sectors that can be of use for others uh, in a more kind of uh, comprehensive way. That's the reason why we have so many uh, co-financing uh, transactions with multilaterals, with other uh, DFIs, and of course with the private sector. And the other point is that uh, the host governments, the countries, are different, uh, of course, uh, one uh, by one, meaning that that's the reason why uh, not just the financial structural part, but the bilateral uh, coordination is also needed. That's the reason uh, we have uh, built uh, an India-Japan fund uh, with uh, the NIIF uh, here in India. But before that, we signed uh, a, global, uh, a clean growth platform uh, with NIIF in order to uh, kind of uh, mobilize not just the capital, but in order to structure those projects uh, with our counterparts. and. We also have uh, same types of uh, uh, platforms with Indonesia, Vietnam, because each country has different energy mix. They have different platforms. Uh, they have different policies. That, I think that's the way uh, we, we are able to uh, coordinate, not within our own uh, ability. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on uh, coordination um, because this is really crucial. The task is so huge and the only way we're ever going to reach scale is if we really trust each other, right? And we cannot have projects where we are co-financing, which means that both of us are doing a really full due diligence. And that's exactly what these kind of memorandums of understanding are all about, right? So it's about kind of figuring out who has the specialist knowledge, who's going to take a lead, and what are we going to trust to them? And, you know, being brave enough, being bold enough to give up the control. And that's the only way we're going to do it. And at EIB, we're doing that more and more, but we need to get much better at it and putting it into practice. I also want to just say on the people question, this point about aggregators is so crucial to us. I mentioned um, State Bank of India, IREDA. We can only really do business in renewable energy in India because those organizations have the technical skills. Um, and I think the investment in those skills is really, really crucial. So we haven't talked so much about education um, today, but you know, for India to get the most out of this energy transition, that's where you also need to be thinking, um, and that's for the private sector. Mr. Kemka, skills, skills not just in India, but in other countries which maybe don't even have those uh, institutions like the State Bank of India, where are we going to get those? So picking up on what Nina and Anjali were saying, if this challenge is much bigger than all the accumulated resources, the coordination level has to be much higher to utilize the skills that exist in all our organizations we're working together by paying forward the trust, as if we've all known each other for 20 years, and we've got the world's greatest challenge. That's number one. Number two. We need a capital adequacy report for skills, for human capital. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a great analogy. The second is we need real skills on the ground. There's no substitute for solar engineers. And two, I was struck by what Chairman Itiayo told talked about, the loss of 20 million jobs. There needs to be huge reskilling programs put in place. It may not be the same place. Mobility in India is quite high, but still. But that needs to be done. It needs to be part of the plan from ab initio again. And the third thing is actually on the coordination point I was talking about. If the coordination to de-risk and therefore reduce the cost of capital 
to a infrastructure cost of capital from a private equity capital cost of capital needs to be done again and again and again on country platforms all over the planet, then we need people who can run these coordination processes. I'm calling for a climate core. And this is going to make all of you laugh. It's a climate core of grandfathers and grandmothers, retired people from consult consulting, investment banking, accounting, who want to help their grandchildren, who are willing to spend the time to co cohere these processes. And this is gold dust. It's more important than a ba balance sheet having 10% more money to lend, is getting these processes right. I'm calling for the creation of that coordinating core of people. I was using that a bit facetious to say, to say grandparents. But anyone can volunteer real professional skills to create de-risking processes across the global south, that will make a big difference in achieving the process we discussed earlier. Thank you. Now, I am going to go to the floor in a very short while, in a very short while, but I do want to take one point forward that uh, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, you made, Ms. Mansell, and that is adaptation. Um, and this is a hard subject to have on a, in a finance section, but I do want to put it out there and see what the ideas are. Maybe we're not there yet, but how can private finance go into adaptation? I'll start with you, Mr. Podar. Anything, blue sky thinking. Um, it's a very tricky one, I and mean, it's been talked about endlessly, right? Because fundamentally, adaptations don't create commercial outcomes. The way that we look at this is, however, when we are, let's say, financing or putting money in very large infrastructure projects, roads, solar plants, I'm amazed how many times my management team comes to me and says, oh, this was a once in 100 year phenomenon. Every year, there's a once in 100 year phenomenon, right? So we anyway end up investing significantly for adaptation because the infrastructure assets have to adapt to the changing climate change. The world climate has, is changing. You know, there's no more it's going to come in the future, right? So we do end up now as we look at our own investment case, provide for a certain amount of capital outlay uh, when it comes to for adaptation itself. So honestly, as capital providers, we're looking at that as a cost item right now. Uh, we've not terribly cracked the case where this can convert into a commercial uh, investment, so per se. Um, I want to just uh, quickly sort of follow on from that point about infrastructure to you, Mikita-san. Um, is there a sense in which we have come to understand what the costs are more broadly um, in two countries in the global south of maybe cutting some corners on the quality of the infrastructure we build? Is there a way in which we can turn um, our understanding now of the benefits of quality infrastructure into a revenue stream going forward? Yes, thank you very much. Um, regarding uh, the quality infrastructure, yes, uh, for example, uh, everyone has an, uh, an image that uh, the Japanese products uh, uh, operations are uh, much more expensive uh, than others. But on the other hand, you have to uh, look through the life cycle uh, Costs. The, uh, you have to understand the life cycle assessment, meaning that, uh, of course, uh, if even if uh, the product or the service or the transaction is cheaper than another, but uh, maybe the tenor, the lifeline uh, of, uh, of the e power plant or whatever uh, the infrastructure uh, might be much more uh, shorter. So it depends on how much you can afford, and it depends on how uh, large you actually. Uh, uh, draw the picture regarding your uh, renewable energy uh, platform, for example. So it's kind of a multiple uh, question, but uh, at the very end, uh, at least from J Japan's domestic experience, it seems that the uh, lifetime uh, assessment uh, works uh, better than uh, changing uh, every uh, decade or so. And of course, your lifetime expectations change as uh, once you introduce the adaptation to climate change into the, into the picture. Right, I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Um, as Ms. Bansal mentioned, that returns on green investments are fairly low risk. So my question is to Dr. Fenton. When you mentioned that in the boardroom with lawyers, they're a bit, uh, you know, that bit, uh, sort of like they're reluctant to 
invest in such sort of uh, investments projects, uh, green investment projects. So what are the sort of risks that the EIB thinks are there to investing in such sort of projects with, within the context of the Global South? And maybe Mr. Kemka can chime in later. Thank you. Could you could you just uh, um, tighten your question a little? Exactly what is? Uh, are you trying to ask her for what risks in particular multilateral lenders see in the global south? What makes those risks different? Uh, sort of what what sort of risks do they see in terms of policy decisions? Is what are it the policy risks, and how would you evaluate? Okay, so I'm not an energy sector specialist, but I think you know energy Across markets is a big thing. Um, for us, actually, a big thing is um, environmental and social. So you are building a solar park. Are you, at, as an investor, at risk of having people protesting because they've been resettled and the proper policies have not been followed? For us, that is a really, really big thing that actually stops us um, working. And actually, that's one of the things, again, I was referring to the people in these aggregators who would understand our um, environmental, social um, framework and be able to help us um, apply that. And I think that would be really actually quite important for us be, to be able to do more, to be able to trust them. And here we have partners who we can trust on that. Um, and it, it's, it's really important. Right. And I think I'm going to stay with that for a bit because that's your stage one, um, you know, creating the target. Uh, you know, is that a mechanism in your head of reducing policy risk? Well, it's, uh, again, back to Abhishek's point, not that difficult. So I'm here today on behalf of the Kemka Foundation. It's a philanthropic organization, the oldest Indian foundation to focus on climate change, perhaps from 92 onwards. However, I do wear another hat. As a business person, we invested in Gujarat so. Now, at some, we invested early, to 2010. The tariff was high. Later on, the government said, well, we're not sure we're comfortable with the tariff being high. Let's renegotiate. The Gujarat regulator slapped that down. That was a huge vote of confidence for all of us investing. To have an independent regulator. Mawa, I used to talk to you on your bus thing. I said, it's not enough. You should have an independent regulator for the bus section. Forgive me, I'm being very open with people. You know, the, the recourse to independent regulator who can make quick decisions. You don't go through court processes. In stage two of my process is a very critical part of what we need to do clear, transparent rules, which are going to be well enforced by you know, most Indian civil servants of very high quality. Give them the independence, give them the mandate, and get on with it. I mean, this is a broader question. We are talking about going into partnership between the partnerships between the private, private finance and the government and the public sector. Uh, but from an Indian perspective, uh, you know, it looks like that is always going to be uh, maybe unbalanced in favor of the government. Um, it's just something that is built, that is baked into the structure. How do you escape that? How, if you're trying to manage political risk, is the best way to manage political risk being in partnership with the source of political risk? Well, then we can take this offline as well. <laughs> but I would submit that is not political risk. That's actually technology risk. So the reason renewable energy has taken off is because now PPAs are not at 14 rupees, but four. And that has happened because technology cost curves have shifted down. You know, everyone loves to talk about 15 years ago, clean tech 1.0, everybody lost money because, because technology was not at a cost level enough, low enough, and it required subsidy. Industries scale when they are no longer subsidy dependent. So when they become independent of policy in intervention, and that is when real scale happens. So, Hence, if we had to solve for that, if you know, someone's bid at a PPA of 14 and now cost curves have shifted, new solar technology is at four, what is a bridging financing mechanism to make up for their loss? So again, I would submit that's a finance structuring. We should think about it. For sure, we should think about it. I know a lot of people who are out of money because they bid PPAs, including we also serve on the board of Tata Power. So we are all sailing in that same boat where you submitted a PPA, you've kind of done project costing at that level. And now it is a different level at all, or, or of realization. Um, you talked about skilling and people. If you're doing a climate core, which I think is a great idea, let's get the seniors in the room who trust each other, have worked with each other for 20, 30, 40 years. Let's get the youngsters in the room as well. They have no baggage. They are fearless in wanting to solve the problem. And that, their future is actually at risk. 
So do a combined climate core. Right. Um, let's move to this side. <laughs> like there's a discussion about uh, the finance sector working in silos, and there's a need for coordination as well as leadership. So this might sound silly, but my uh, idea is like, is it is the solution as silly as uh, Niti Aayog taking the leadership and pulling off another UPI level platform just for climate finance and energy trading again? You're literally you're literally ten seconds too late for that question. <laughs> It is being worked upon. A DPI for climate, Digital Public Infrastructure for Climate Initiative is underway. Folks who want to volunteer and give time and devote sort of volunteer energy and time with no particular personal outcome or outcome for your company, please, please feel free to message me. Yeah, in the context of digital public infrastructure, I just want to mention briefly uh, an initiative called GRAIL. Green AI Learning, which is looking at how AI can help apply itself to solving climate change. It's something that our foundation is involved with, but also a number of other foundations and inst educational institutions around the world. India should be at the center of it. Wonderful. That's one way, of course, one way of solving the human capital problem is AI. My question to the panel is, as per Oxfam report, many advanced economies are using several dishonest and misleading accounting to inflate their climate finance contribution to the developing countries. So what are the steps that have been taken or it can be done to mitigate such unethical behavior? Thank you. Right. So the, the question here is that when one looks at these overall numbers that we hear of the money flowing from the global north to the global south, the contributions of certain countries to climate finance. There are reports out there which say that those numbers can be overstated. How can we have a clearer sense of what the, the flows, financial flows in climate finance actually are? Does anyone want to take that somewhat difficult question? Dr. Fenton. I, I mean, to me, I think it's clear that the financial flows are not enough. It doesn't matter. We, it, doesn't it doesn't matter, matter what how much claiming. not enough. It's got to be a lot more. So <laughs> the answer to your question, uh, boss, is that people like Oxfam are arguing over 70 billion versus 80 billion. God knows what, right? Uh, uh, none of that matters. All right, 70 million versus 80 million doesn't matter because what you think, what you want to think about, is in hundreds of billions, right? In tens of billions. Uh, uh, per year. And don't worry about who's accounting for what, just see what the growth is over time. Uh, my question is more on, uh, more to Mr. Satoshi and Mr. Fenton, but anyone is free to answer. What we have been given to understand is that the funding is only coming for green projects, whereas it's more required for brown companies from coming to more brown to less brown, where the funding is not coming. So the fixation on green part and the other fixation on financing only for mitigation and not for adaptation. So two questions. So um, I, I'm just going to sort of add a little bit more to that. We've heard a, a, a bit about adaptation and I'd like to hear if anybody else has any ideas of that. But also just to make this division very sharp, there is one stream of thinking in finance, um, in particularly in the global market, but in general, which says, we have to beware of greenwashing, right? And it's all about the additionality. If there's somebody who comes to me for green finance, who also has brown operations, I don't want to give it to this person. If this is someone who is coming to me um, in order to free up some of their own capital to reinvest in brown operations, that is greenwashing. And then there is this other view, um, which says that no, there is a question of transitioning large companies it is sometimes a question of transitioning sectors, step by step, stage by stage, from brown to less brown, or large conglomerates which have brown operations, which have to set up uh, uh, greener operations. That's a completely different view of the world and a completely different view of what greenwashing actually is. What should we be, how should we be thinking about this? Um, so on adaptation, you're absolutely right. We at EIB, we've decided we need to do more. We set our goal at 15% of climate finance being on adaptation. We're not there yet, but I think there are a lot of opportunities actually. And a lot of it, we had our chief climate specialist here like a couple of weeks ago, and there are so many opportunities on new projects, even sometimes small things. So she was giving an example of, of metros and you know the metro companies in some countries saying, well, we don't have a problem with adaptation because well, they're all raised. And then she was saying, well, where do the trains go? You know, Where's the depot? And they're like, oh, 
okay, actually, we, we do have an nice issue. So, so simple stuff like that. Um, on this issue of brown companies moving to green, we have a framework in EIB, it's called um, Paris Alignment Transition Framework, I, I forget the actual acronym, PATH Framework, which means that we can work with fossil fuel heavy companies if they have a convincing plan that they're moving away from that. Now, uh, then this also intersects with this question about greenwashing, um, what is a convincing transition plan? Um, and we have some guidelines there as to what that might look like, but it's something that people are very, very much working on. Um, and, you know, we have the EU taxonomy for, um, you know, what is green. And I think there are still some issues with that. Um, but this issue of transition finance, and you know, I, I think orange, I think, might be the color that it's referred We're to. We're running out of colors in this field. Yeah. <laughs> I have noticed. Um, but the standards are really important because otherwise you're never going to get people to put money in it because they will see, okay, it's just some kind of a greenwashing here. But it's very important. So we need to have a proper standard so that the money can flow into it. We have a couple of people who do want to come in on that. Um. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, what, regarding our policy, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, each country has its own energy mix, its own plans. Of course, each corporate has their own uh, business, their own uh, plans. So uh, from our uh, perspective and our policy, uh, for example, uh, many people talk about coal, also uh, about gas, LNG. But uh, for uh, many countries, uh, leapfrogging just from coal to uh, renewable uh, seems unrealistic. If you talk about your the decarbonization plan uh, towards 2050, but you won't be able to just uh, shut down the coal power plants, just build new renewable uh, power plants in a year or two to uh, actually uh, provide all uh, the power uh, that is needed. So. That's our position to not, of course, we would support uh, and enhance, try to enhance uh, greener projects uh, within the uh, energy uh, portfolio. But for countries that need uh, LNG gas fired power plants for the next decade or so, we would also support those projects as well, together with the Japanese government. So, uh, energy transition, even if it's on a corporate basis or a, a, a government a public basis, we are there to kind of uh, go step by step with our customers, whether it's uh, foreign government or whether it's uh, uh, domestic or uh, foreign corporates. I suppose there are some thoughts on this. You know, I think um, I'm not going to get into greenwashing because it honestly, in my mind, falls in the same ambit as what you're talking about. The requirement is so big, big, you know, some bit of it is getting greenwashed, to be honest, right? I think the bigger question is the hard to abate sector. If you, want to, if you want to really solve this energy transition, really you need to go to the source of carbon. That's the steel, that's the refineries, that's the cement, right? And those are easier said than done to transition because I get what you were saying. You know, I, I said on the just energy transition for Vietnam and Indonesia, it's very easy for developed countries to say transition to renewables, it doesn't happen. And same thing for us. So I, th I think the, the, the point is this is where the government and the multilaterals really have to step in. And we have to take a practical view to this. This is not where the commercial capital is, is inherently going to flow in because the risks are way too high. But this is where the coordination and the impact is significantly more in my mind. Uh, the, the point about the last point you made about brown and green, I think, was well addressed on, by, by focusing at the project level. We bring our lens to the project level and have carrot and stick, then I think we could edge it out. There's only a few seconds, so I won't go deeper into that. On adaptation, I think you break it apart into where there are cash flows. For example, private health clinics can be blended to then invest, be invested in for the extra cost that Abhishek was talking about, and where there are no private sector cash flows, which are inherently government or philanthropy. And finally, why is adaptation so important? I'll leave you with this one. Point. A week ago, we hosted a big summit on climate tipping points as a foundation in Reykjavik. Most people in this room have crossed the first river of knowing that climate change is extremely serious. We need to do something about it. I would urge you to cross the second river of realizing how close the tipping points are. Johan Rockström, Sir David King, watch the YouTube videos. We are very close to the edge. Everything matters right now. I don't care what foundation I'm in. Let's work together as human beings for our children, for our grandchildren, with all the strength we have. 
actually make a difference and move this along. Thank you. Thank you very much, and perfect timing. Where time is up. Um, thank you to the panel. Um, uh, I think that we covered a large number of things, and we ended with an exhortation to action and a reminder that there's something that we could all do, regardless of age. Um, and I think that works. So thank you all for being a great audience.